but so we're going to talk about the natal hormones. Okay, so starting from the hypothalamus, the gonadotropins are triggered to release from the pituitary by gonadotropin releasing hormone. And we actually have two gonadotropins, LH and FSH, follicle stimulating hormone and good night hormone. And they're going to target the gonadal tissue in both males and females. And then we have downstream effects. So what ends up happening here in, um, in the gonads is we increase production of a hormone called gibbon. And then we also generate the androgens. Or the estrogens and progestins. And so our feedback inhibit, just like its name suggests, it's going to feed back onto the hypothalamus and onto the pituitary, both in negative, uh, ne negative feedback. Uh, the androgens and the estrogens, they actually are going to feed back onto the pituitary with a positive influence, but are going to feed back onto the hypothalamus with a negative influence. Remember from last time, if I were to give you a figure like this, I'd want you to be able to dissect what's going on. Androgens, and given the androgens and estrogens are for progestins. Uh, uh, yep, yeah, it's a positive feedback from the androgen and estrogens on the pituitary and on LH and FSH secretion. Two, those two hormones have the negative influence on that response. So I want to move, move forward here just a little bit. Um, so we're still addressing the hypothalamus and the interaction with the anterior pituitary. <coughs> um, and so what I want to do now is talk a little bit about a little bit about the the release. A little bit about the release of these uh, anterior attackers. Uh, so a lot of times secretion follows a rhythmic pattern. measure, let's say, androgens in the middle of the day and then in the middle of the night, they may actually have pretty different concentrations. And it's because of this rhythmic secretion pattern. And it appears that this rhythmic pattern, where you have higher secretion at some times, lower secretion at other times during the day, is arising from a nucleus in the hypothalamus that's called the suprachiasmatic 
So this rhythmic pattern is possibly regulated by the suprachiasmatic nucleus. We refer to this rhythmic pattern as being a biological clock. And even though it appears that it affects other uh, physiological phenomena, possibly the wake sleep cycle, possibly uh, hunger cycle, when you feel hungry, maybe driven by this biological clock, it's also going to have action on the hypothalamus. And in particular in the hypothalamus, we're going to affect the secretion from the cells, the pattern of secretion from the cells that secrete the releasing and inhibiting hormones. Yes, on those cells. Okay, and so there's there, there's a few questions that need to be addressed. The big one in particular is how does this clock get set? Um, and so you all have clocks you know, on your computer or a wristwatch uh, or on your cell phone. And you may or may not know that a lot of those devices, well, the wristwatch, a lot of times you have to change the battery, wind it up, do something to, to, to make sure that it keeps accurate time. On your electronic devices, your clock is reset on a pretty routine basis, a couple times a day. It goes out to a, uh, a website um, for the US government that um, picks up information from the atomic clock that's based in Washington, D.C. And they use a cesium ion, the loss of an electron, the loss of an electron from the cesium ion, which happens about once a second, to set that particular clock, what's called the atomic clock. And all of our electronic devices basically feed back to, eventually to that, uh, that rhythmic release. So we actually have to set the biological clock as well. And so how does the biological clock actually get set? And the way that we explain this is the clock is adjusted or synchronized by what are known as zeitgeists. German word that means time difference. And so we have these cues that are around us that will help to synchronize that clock. And you've all experienced this before. One of the big zeitgeivers is the patterns of light from the sun that changes with the seasons. And those patterns from the light of the seasons and train the release of our inhibiting and our releasing hormones from the hypothalamus. And they guide those throughout throughout the year and throughout the seasons. Um, so whenever we change our clocks, our digital clock in our bedroom, right, we uh, fall back or spring forward. Um, it messes everything up. You basically go forward a whole hour, and you probably are still going to be like, okay, I need to get up at 6.30. And so you set your own and train. Yep. And so you set your alarm for 6.30, right? The day before, the day after, and technically the day after, depending on which way we're going, it's either going to be 5.30 in the morning or 7.30 in the morning, right? And so you have this one hour shift that happens, and chances are, and if it's not ha happening now, 
as you age, it'll begin to happen more. You get on a very routine sleeping schedule. You go to bed at the same time, and you basically get up at the same time, and you basically don't really have to use a alarm clock. You just wake up at 5 a.m., wake up at 6 a.m., whatever you can train your body to do. Except for that day that they switch the clock, and then you miss your alarm, or you have to use an alarm because you're getting up at a different time now. Or if we're going in the one direction, you get up really, really early. Or if you've ever traveled and gone through time zones, you end up four hours away, and it's like 2 o'clock in the morning, and you're wide awake and ready to go. And that's because we're biologically entrained to these patterns. Whenever you have some sort of event like that, that shifts that pattern in a short amount of time, you end up with, uh, you end up with a, a biological response, a very biological response. So did you know that both times we set the clock uh, between daylight savings and uh, standard daylight time or whatever it is, those week, the week after both of those is the highest rates of cardiovascular events in the United States. So we mess up our biological clock for about a week before we readjust adjust and retrain. And uh, elderly individuals don't do this as well as younger individuals. Will increase the, the, the rate of myocardial infarction and other, other cardiovascular events. So, there's been studies that have been done on the Zeitgeivers, and one of them in particular, if you biologically inhibit or cause an organism to lose their Zeitgeiver, they have what's known as a free running circadian rhythm and they lose the pattern. And so an individual with a free running circadian rhythm, they don't have the same types of patterns that uh, individuals with an entrained Zeitgeiber or biological clock are gonna have. Uh, eating becomes very strange hypothalamic release of these inhibiting hormones no longer is synchronized and pulsatile. Uh, it's just it's very, very rapid. So. No, why? I really didn't cut that. So the racist in our classroom. Shut up! <laughs> <laughs> I know. Oh, okay. Uh, all right, so let's talk about the non-blood regulation of, uh, of the pituitary. So we have the interaction of the hypothalamus with the anterior pituitary, which is through the parvocellular neurosecretory system, and through the hypothalamic hypothesial portal system. But we also have some non-blood regulation of the pituitary, in particular the posterior side. <coughs> Excuse me. And so we have a little bit different setup here. So this is anterior pituitary here. This is the, um, the, the posterior pituitary on this side. And so what you can see is we actually have two different nucleuses, the supraoptic nucleus and the paraventricular nucleus that permeate neurons down to the posterior side of the pituitary. Now, the posterior side of the pituitary is neuronal tissue, it's neurons. Okay, so it's, it resembles what we have in the hypothalamus, whereas the anterior side is exothermic. And so it resembles more like what we have in the adrenal gland and, and in other tissues. So these neurons permeate down into the posterior pituitary, and you can see that they're going to interact with a circulatory system or a, a capillary circuit here. Um, 
So the, the interaction between the hypothalamus and the pituitary is not the same as we see with the anterior pituitary. So this particular combination of the neurons running down to the posterior pituitary for interaction with that posterior uh, capillary bed is called the magnocellular neurosecretory neurons. So the magnocellular neurosecretory neurons. And you have two different sets of neurons that make up this particular system. They're the neurons that arise from the superoptic nucleus, which I'm just going to abbreviate as the SON, and the neurons that arise from the paraventric nucleus, or the PV. And these sets, both sets of neurons, they begin in the hypothalamus and they interact with the posterior lobe. And it turns out that these two sets of neurons produce two different, what are going to be referred to as neurohypophyseal hormones. Yeah, super optic nu nucleus. Yep, superoptic nucleus and the paraventric. All right, so two neur neural hypophyseal hormones. And these are going to be produced within the soma, which is in the hypothalamus, the body of the neuron, where the nucleus is, and then are going to be transported Interrograde or in the soma to synaptic bulb or knob direction down the axon, and they get stored in the axon and in the um, uh, in the synaptic knob, and are going to be wait are going to wait for a, a releasing signal. So we have oxytocin, abbreviated OT, and then arginine. Vasopressin, AVP, also known as vasopressin, simply vasopressin, or antidiuretic hormone, which is probably more familiar to you all. Okay, so again, oxytocin, arginine, vasopressin, uh, they are produced in the cell bodies of the neurons. Which are located anatomically within the hypothalamic tissue. within the hypothalamus, and then they will be, as they're produced, transported to the axon, in particular the axon terminal, in the pars nervosa, of the posterior pituitary. So the superoptic nucleus and the paraventricular nucleus, they both produce only one of these, um, one of these hormones. The SON, superoptic nucleus, is going to have high production of ABP, 
in the paraventricular nucleus by production of oxytocin. Okay, so both ADP and um, oxytocin, arginine, vasopressin, and oxytocin are uh, peptide hormones, and so they are going to be genetically defined. Genetically defined. So there's going to be a gene in the genome. They actually both uh, are going to be situated on chromosome number 20 in humans. Both on chromosome 20 in humans. And they are associated with a, both with the same or uh, both on the same pro hormone. Pars nervosa. Oh, it doesn't catch up. Okay, so we're both on chromosome 20, uh, and actually they're going to be associated with the same with the same gene on chromosome 20. Associated with a gene called the neurophysic. Gene. This is going to be the pro hormone. For both ADP and RP. Okay. <coughs> Neurophysin. <coughs> Neurophysin is a large protein. And within the length of this large protein, we're going to hold a pre pro. Oxytocin or NP1 area or section that carries two of the oxytocin genes. Okay, so you have amino acid sequences for uh, oxytocin that are repeated twice within this pre pro oxytocin neurophysic 1 area of the gene. We also have a pre pro arginine vasopressin neurophysin 2 region of the gene that has just a single ABP sequence or amino acid sequence. So both ABP and oxytocin. Residues. And in both molecules, amino acid number one and amino acid number six are cysteine and are used for disulfide bridges. The neurophysin protein may act as a chaperone, chaperone protein for the axonal transport process. So it's a big long protein, it gets broken up, we get basically three nine amino acid polypeptides after this gets cleaved up, two oxytocin hormones, one arginine vasopressin hormone, 
and then the other parts of the neural fibers gene may act in protecting those hormones during that transport process down in the axon terminal. Nana peptides. N O N A, which just means there's nine Axonal. So it says the neural physin and E may act as a chaperone for axonal transport. It's N P one. It's it's just the way that it's designated. It's the uh, one section, the first the first subsection of the neural physin, and the second subsection of the neural physin. All right, so let's talk through what these two hormones do, and we'll start out with the oxytocin. So the effects that we have for oxytocin is it induces uterine smooth muscle contraction, which really only should occur during the birthing process of parturition. So if you look at the uterus, the uterine wall has, um, or uterine, yeah, the uterine wall has uh, several different layers. You have what's called the stratum functionalis, which is what increases and sloughs off every 28 days on average during the sexual cycle. It's also going to be the, the layer that uh, will have implantation and um, growth of the, of the fetus um, through ontogeny. Uh, then you have a layer called the myometrium, which is the smooth muscle portion. And so it's going to be this myometrium. The cells will have the ability to interact with oxytocin. And when oxytocin binds that receptor that's in the, the myometrial cells, it induces them to undergo contraction, which squeezes on the baby. The baby gets pushed out of the birth. Oxytocin is also going to be involved in milk letdown and ejection. So oxytocin levels actually increase uh, with latch on and suckling during um, their nursing of an infant. Um, and so the oxytocin levels will increase and they will uh, interact with that uh, bioepithelium which is kind of the, it's epithelial tissue in the lobules of the um, membrane tissue, but it has the tractile ability to sort of squeeze out the, the lobules, which is where the milk is produced and released from, and will allow that milk to be let down from those lobules to the gut system to then be um, ejected uh, to a suckling baby. And so it's actually that suckling process where you have an apparent action potential that gets sent or is initiated because of suckling, it's sent to the superoptic nucleus and to the paraventricular nucleus. And there's about a 10 to 12 second delay, which is kind of the uh, the, the movement of that action potential up to the hypothalamus, the release of those hormones to circulate in the bloodstream, interaction with those hormones of oxytocin with the myoepithelium to begin to have uh, contraction and to release milk from the mammary tissue. It's a 10 to 12 second delay. And milk is 
There are also some possible additional effects for oxytocin. One of those effects is to induce what's going to be referred to as maternal behavior. So this idea that caring for a child and love and those emotional connections could be regulated in part by oxytocin. There's also some evidence that oxytocin is involved in the mating process or mating behavior. Clearly in humans, that's probably a harder, um, a harder question to ask uh, because both the mating behavior and then a third um, possible third possible effect for oxytocin is the involved in sexual response. Those are difficult to test in humans, right? Because um, when you're intimate with your husband or your wife, you probably don't want to have needles to draw blood and stuff like that. So asking that question in in humans is very, very difficult. It's actually difficult in animals as well because it induces stress that's abnormal to that normal process. So that's why they're possible or hypothetical, um, hypothetical effects. All right, so how, <coughs> how is oxytocin actually going to be produced? So during the parturition, we're going to undergo a process known as cervical stretching. And cervical stretching ultimately leads to oxytocin release. And so we actually have a series of neurons that are involved in this uh, reflex loop, where from the cervix, we target the hypothalamus. We have an inner neuron between that neuron and the neurons that arise from the paraventricular nucleus to trigger the secretion of already produced oxytocin. And it's, they're held up in vesicles, and so be thinking exocytosis. So we induce exocytosis to release oxytocin into the bloodstream, and it circulates, and it will react with, interact with receptors, interact with receptors on the myometrial cells, the cells, the muscle, smooth muscle cells in the uterus, causing them to contract. Now, what happens with contraction? Pushes down on baby harder, which causes more cervical stretching. And so this loop occurs over and over again where we're increasing cervical stretching. So what kind of loop is this? It's a positive feedback loop. Got a positive feedback loop of parturition. And once baby is expelled from the from the birth canal, we no longer have that cervical stretching. And so now we no longer have the activation of that nerve leading back to the hypothalamus, and oxytocin levels should begin to should begin to drop. Now what's pretty amazing is that oxytocin also is released through both visual in auditory cues. And so when a nursing mother sees or hears their hungry baby, it also can induce oxytocin release and prepare the mammary tissue for feeding. So you all have watched The Office, right? So, <laughs> yeah. You all, you all watch The Office? You remember the, the episode where Pam and, and uh, Jim just had their baby, and Kevin, he keeps going around, and every time he's around Pam Beasley, he's like, Everything you need to know about this, you know, The Office. <laughs> 
All right, so it, it, does anyone recognize the term parabiosis? Or maybe parabiosis experiment? So these are somewhat controversial experiments, um, but they were used and actually sometimes still used even today, where you take two individual animals and you surgically connect their circulatory system together and you do one thing in one animal and observe something else in the other. Connect circulation of two individuals together. And there was a study that was done, a parabiosis study that was done with oxytocin. Uh, and so, what was allowed to happen is stimulation of oxytocin release in one animal and then observation of the effects in the other. Could be, doesn't necessarily have to be. So it's clear as part of my humans. Well, um, <laughs> um, it was classically done a lot of times in rats, but there were some kind of parabiosis experiments that were done in, in dogs and in mice as well. Um, I don't know of any of in like uh, primates, but it's possible in the live world biology out there. So you take bigger, a bigger artery and a bigger vein, and dissect those out into attached to circulation, uh, attached to the circulation, and put the two together. Uh, and like, you know, usually it was done with like a, um, like a, a stick. They would place the stick between the two to connect the vessels together. Well, you can survive for a little while without the sexual effect. But we're using, usually probably genetically at Different strains of, of rats on this. And so you connect up, usually it was done with something like the carotid artery and the moral vein. So you connect those two things together so you have a big long circuit. They get restrained, they get put into a, a surgical restraint. Well, they, we do that all the time during surgery, you get restrained. The, the animals aren't necessarily conscious. They, they're probably stated somehow. Well, right. I was thinking about acid. They probably, they're probably just acid. Okay, so this so is a very it, short process. It's a very short process. Yeah, we're not like... Okay. Oh, no. That, that's yeah. why I was getting around. I thought I was like multiple days. Yeah. No, 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 no. Yeah, that's, that's good clarification. This is like hours, not, not years. We started the experiment by day two. They were just fighting all the time. Uh, and so with this experimental setup, what they would do is they would simulate oxytocin. Uh, and so like some of these possible effects that we talked about before came from these parabiosis experiments and lower order organisms. Um, and so what we know about oxytocin yeah, I'll take that into account. And so we proceed with caution whenever we have um, pretty abnormal living conditions like a parabiosis experiment. You would be able to observe something, and whatever you observe, that's what you begin to chase. Science is it's incremental, right? And it's all about looking at it from a whole bunch of different viewpoints. Right? If I move around the room, I'm going to get different viewpoints of what's going on in the room. And so it's just, it was one way to, to 
um, biologically control a specific hormone at a specific time. You all seem to be like really offended by these experiments. I'm just curious. Okay, all right. Are people doing that? Yeah. You never heard of people doing that before? Well, you always heard of like the like super brains, like I took someone's arm and put it on someone else's leg. Yeah, we've grown an ear on this mouse, which turns out to actually be interesting stuff. You lose your ear in an accident or frostbite or something. You may have access to more to regenerate that ear and provide that ear back to the patient. So you guys should read some of the old experiments that have been done. Blood pressure, do you know how blood pressure was first measured? They took a long tube and connected it to the circulation of a horse and watched how the blood would move column would break. And so they literally were outside, had this horse lying down on its side, there's pictures written from the original article back in the 1800s, and they had these big long tubes that were literally hung up in the mountains. And they would watch and see how that blood moved the, the column of pressure. So that has changed. Uh, I'm sure the horse probably did so. You know what? Y'all wear makeup, right? Shame on you. Because they do way worse stuff in uh, testing. Yeah, that's just, that's, just a, that's just a way for you to buy super expensive stuff and pay a lot of money. All right. Um, so, is there? <clears throat> that, that's what that's what we are using to make some of these observations for the possible. So, like, the reason they're possible, maternal behavior, or uh, baby behavior, or sexual response, other things that oxytocin may do. Uh, what's that? So, parabiosis experiments were, were done to address a lot of these questions. I don't know. There's some weird stuff that was done in, in the Soviet Union back in the 1920s. There was the Kumansi project. Um, if you've not read about this, it's pretty crazy stuff. They basically took um, women and bred them with, with male chimps. And the idea was that chimps are extremely strong. And so if they could produce offspring that have both male or both human and chimpanzee characteristics, but they're intelligent, really intelligent, and really soft, strong, you have a superpower army. Like to what? I call it the Humanity Project. Um, I can't remember exactly what it was called, but it was the idea of humans and chimps being bred together. Um, yeah. I, well, there's there's a I can't remember what the results are, but there was a there was going to be a project in Europe. I think in 2019, or maybe it was 2018, where they were going to take a, they were going to remove the head from a paralyzed individual and put it onto a donor body that had, yeah. I mean, that's like, that's crazy stuff. That's way worse than, for example, where, so, <laughs> I'm guessing it probably didn't because we didn't read your yeah. <laughs> They did experiments with monkeys back in the 1970s. And the monkeys, they, they were able to revitalize the monkey, but it only lived for a short amount of time. They did that with human creatures. Um, and it lived for just a short amount of time. But you have to reconnect. You gotta really take all the nervous tissue, the vessels, the muscle. I mean, they probably would pull out individual muscles and leave it intact from, you know, like the, the sternocleidal mass of. Like, is that like Micah? 
you, we're definitely not like Legos. The, the most uh, descriptive, the most descriptive um, the most pronounced description I've ever heard about working on uh, humans like surgical work is like an auto mechanic working with the engine running. Okay, so what's the essential role for oxytocin? Uh, and so I want to give you an experiment for this. Maybe this one will be less controversial. So in this experiment, they used a knockout model. So what's a knockout model? Anyone know what that So if I made an oxytocin knockout model. So yeah, basically of rendering that behavior functionless. So this mouse has no functional OTG. And so in theory, you should be able to produce any sort of functional protein, right? So when we knocked out oxytocin and let the mice develop, the mice were What happened to these mice? What do you think? Yes. Make a knockout box. Put on a box. <laughs> so what happened to these mice? This is still recording. <laughs> and I'm not going through it like getting rid of all of these stupid topics. What happened to the mice? What do you think? Okay, so I, I think Brady said dead. Okay, we have therapy. They have issues. So they were actually viable. They were fertile. They had normal behavior. And they actually underwent normal parturition. That's crazy. Especially the normal part of Christian part. They actually give birth mice. How old? Well, <laughs> however, the offspring, the offspring, offspring were chimpanzees. No, the offspring died. offspring die is because the knockout mice had no no flat down. And so they could not feed the offspring. Yeah, I mean, yeah, you could do that. You could give them infant formula for mice. They would have been fine. Yeah, so it wasn't that the offspring had any sort of thing wrong with them or anything wrong with them. They just they didn't get the proper nutrition that they needed in the experiment. And so. They were, yep. So the, the knockout mice were, were fine, but they became parents. Everything went fine there. The animals were born. They couldn't feed them. They had no milk production, and so the offspring had, had didn't have proper nutrition. Yeah. 
So just throw everything that we know about oxytocin out the window, yeah. which now means we don't understand oxytocin, which means that we don't know how to use a drug called pitocin, which is a drug that's commonly You're used, stuff up. which is a drug commonly used to induce labor in individuals who don't go through proper labor, which causes the baby to be born normally rather than dying. So I think that probably we're a really good stewards of God's creation. When we use lower order organisms that God has not elevated to the same spiritual level that he has humans. Okay, so during and near birth. increase in the plasma levels. Okay, and this is occurring during those final stages of labor. No. We see an increase in the oxytocin receptor with more parturition. Okay, so oxytocin levels increase in the plasma during the final stages of labor. Oxytocin receptors before parturition are going to increase. So basically, we're preparing the uterine tissue so that it actually can respond to oxytocin. Progesterone decreases the oxytocin receptors, which is kind of interesting because during moments of pregnancy, progesterone levels are relatively high. And so we actually are probably holding back the oxytocin receptor. And then estrogen levels, when they increase, will result in increases in the oxytocin receptor. So progesterone levels hold oxytocin receptors down. Estrogen levels, which estrogen gets to increase as we get into parturition, are going to increase oxytocin. And it turns out, so we're still kind of trying to deal with this question here of the knockout mouse goes through normal parturition. So how does that happen? Because don't we need oxytocin for normal parturition? The answer is yes, we do. And so what would be kind of the next conclusion that we need to make? Should there be another source? of oxytocin. And it turns out that there actually is another source of oxytocin. The placenta itself also can increase oxytocin levels. So oxytocin levels do increase in normal mammal or the, the normal physiologically normal mammal. And it probably goes a lot smoother, the birthing process, when you have those normal levels as well. But it appears that there's a backup because the placenta also can produce oxytocin to help out with that birthing process. It produces oxytocin itself. The placenta is also an endocrine structure. And so it has the capability to produce oxytocin. Mm -hmm. You mean like the feedback process? Yeah. No, it doesn't. 
But, yes, but we're holding back, uh, we're holding back the oxytocin receptor with high levels of progesterone during most of pregnancy. Okay? And progesterone comes from two different sources. I think we'll get into this. We're going to talk a little bit about reproductive endocrinology. And progesterone, for about the first eight to ten weeks of pregnancy, is produced by the ovary from the uh, from the corpus luteum. And then after that time point, after, after about ten weeks, it's actually going to be the placenta itself that begins to produce progesterone. And so you actually have progesterone and oxytocin that are produced. And we respond when oxytocin levels, uh, or our, our uh, receptor levels, increase with progesterone drops. So progesterone, as we get up towards about 37, 38 weeks, the whole notion of 40 weeks is kind of, that's not completely the gestational period. The average is probably closer to about 37, 38 weeks. It begins to drop down. The progesterone levels begin to drop. The oxytocin receptor kind of begins to express. So that oxytocin that's produced by the placenta. And then also, because this, and this is probably what gets it going, if you really think about it, right? Because when is baby's head going to push out the surface? When the myometrium squeezes on it. Well, how does the myometrium squeeze? Well, probably some oxytocin that's going to be produced by the placenta. And so that induces the initial the initial part of the process, and then the hypothalamus gets involved to regulate the rest of the the process, but there's at least in mice, these transgenic knockout mice, enough oxytocin produced from the placental tissue to cause uh, a, a relatively normal parturition process. Um, so oxytocin, and did we talk about another one? Oh, right, yeah, okay, so the, the progesterone as well. Um, the placenta of pregnancy also, so let's see here, uh, uh, I think the chorion, um, which is a primordial, it, the chorion becomes the placenta, so we produce chorionic gonadotropin. Um, so we have at least those three. Estrogen maybe is produced as well in small quantities, but I can't remember. Good question. We'll figure it out. How about in males? Is there any effect for oxytocin? Because males produce oxytocin as well because we have a paraventricular nucleus, we have the hydrocellular secretory neurons. It's an eye. And that's a Roman numeral one there. So when you have um, sexual intercourse and during ejaculation, oxytocin levels are actually shown, have been shown to increase during that process. And then oxytocin has also been shown to be a uh, great limiter for sperm transport. So there may be some uh, purposes for oxytocin in the males as well, um, in terms of efficient delivery of the sperm during the ejaculatory process. All right, so we touched on this just a little bit, but I want to go back and, and, and really flesh this out and talk through how oxytocin actually induces contraction of the uterus. So this is a, an image that shows the, the feedback mechanisms here. And you'll see that we have baby in the uterus. You have uh, prostaglandins, oxytocin, estrogen um, from different sources. So anatomically, what we're looking at here is the uterus is going to be comprised of smooth muscle, which is in a layer of the uterus called the myometrium. And those cells, they're just simply smooth muscle cells, which if some of you remember back to anatomy and physiology, it's a non-striated muscle cell. 
the contractile uh, proteins are, are kind of in a network rather than striations, rather than sarcomeres inside of the screw muscle. And so these cells have the capability to, to squish down or contract in multiple directions. It's not just a single, a single uh, contraction direction. So this is all going to be facilitated by those myometrial, myometrial cells, which are smooth muscle cells, that can induce mechanical force. Induce mechanical force during contraction. Force during contraction. Uh, and so in the membrane of these smooth muscle cells, the myometrial cells, is where we're going to find the oxytocin receptor expressed. And again, they are increased the concentration or the density of oxytocin receptors is increased in the presence of estrogen. So what oxytocin actually does when it binds to the oxytocin receptor, it's going to induce an influx of calcium into the myometrial cells resulting in uterine contraction. So this is kind of what uh, a schematic would look like of this smooth muscle myometrial cell. Here's the oxytocin receptor. The small triangle represents oxytocin. You can actually see it's a G-linked mechanism, and it's linked up to an enzyme called PLC. I've already told you exactly everything you need to know about this mechanism. It's PLC, so what do we know about it? First of all, what is PLC? Anyone remember? Phospho, phospholipase C. And so what, what signaling system are we dealing with? It's a PIP2 pathway, okay? So this PIP2 pathway, which we've already gone over that, so I'm not gonna go over it again, but we activate PLC. We know that we have increases in calcium. So the oxytocin receptor complex is going to be formed. And this complex, basically, when we bind the receptor with oxytocin, the downstream where we normally just put in the general terminology, physiological change or metabolic change or cell physiology changes, whatever we're using the terms there, what we're actually specifically going to see is that we're going to inhibit a calcium pump. and in particular the operation of that pump. And it's a pump, so it's actually an ATP base, which means that it requires ATP. Now, what you need to know here really quick is that if this is the membrane, calcium levels are normally very high in a rectal membrane on the outside of the cell. Okay? So if I inhibit this calcium pump, I'm basically inhibiting this pathway that is pumping the already low levels of calcium out of the cell, which means this gets blocked, calcium levels begin to increase in the cell because I'm preventing the removal of calcium from the, uh, from the, from the cell. So we call that the efflux. You could just call it the removal of calcium. That's reduced efflux versus influx. So the efflux or the removal of calcium from the cell, that's going to be reduced. So now we have the situation where calcium is not leaving the cell because there's no mechanism to remove it. 
and as calcium levels increase, we have some changes in voltage that come along with that, right? So calcium levels begin to increase in the cell because it's a plus two charge on that ion. We also have an increase in voltage in the cell. And so now we have a series of channels that are voltage gated complexes. And with that increase in voltage from the calcium remaining in the cell, we open up calcium channels, and now we have even larger influx of calcium. So we start out and block the efflux. This results in changes in voltage to induce opening of calcium channels that allow influx. So calcium levels begin to get really, really high in the cell. Now, because it's a PIP2 pathway, we also are going to know that we are going to generate IP3. And we're going to follow that portion of the PIP2 pathway, what I'm going to refer to as the IP3 pathway. So calcium levels are increasing in the cell. We increase IP3, and you'll remember that one of the things that IP3 does is it targets the sarcoplasm inside of the cell. And so we also are going to increase calcium from this pathway by causing the permeability shift in the sarcoplasm. So we have calcium that's coming from the outside of the cell, calcium that's being released from storage in the sarcoplasm. And the net result here, when oxytocin binds the oxytocin receptor, is to have intracellular calcium levels increase significantly. The story doesn't end there, but I'm on a time. So we're going to get really high levels of calcium, and we still have some more things that we need to go through and do on our way to myometrial contraction.